Um, here we go. This is actually last week we started the FFI online. I gave uh, three presentations uh, to accommodate different time zones on the future of Fly Fishers International and, and where we're headed, which was really fun and we had a lot of great uh, participation. Um, this week starts the uh, diversity in the series of what we're doing online. So, you know, we've got Jerry here doing a whole series of fly tying uh, webinars. Um, Dave Peterson is doing a series on conservation. Don't miss him on Thursday. Talking to the folks at the Bonefish and Tarpon Trust about the uh, uh, hidden, unfound, secret bonefish spawning waters. Uh, and then tomorrow night, I'm on with uh, Jeff Courier from Jeff Cler Courier Global Fly Fishing. He's going to talk about salmon and the uh, giant secret brown trout of Iceland. Um, that should be pretty awesome. So um, keep tuning in and keep looking online to uh, flyfishersinternational.org uh, FF, uh, slash FFI dash online. Uh, and we should have a whole great series here. So uh, without any further ado, Jerry, thanks so much for actually uh, doing your uh, heavy lifting to get this off the ground. I think most people that are tuned in that are fly tires will appreciate that Jerry is in his fly tying basement den uh, with you know all kinds of stuff in the background. Um, some of us aren't lucky to have like our own fly tying dens, um, but uh, you know we got to find a place where we can. So um, Jerry is actually the head of the uh, fly tying group at Fly Fishers International. And Jerry, why don't I hand it off to you, and you can uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself uh, and about the fly tying group and the uh, soft tackles for panfish. Go ahead, Jerry. Thanks a lot, Patrick. Um, just to, as Patrick said, this is uh, the basement. It's my dungeon. Uh, this is where I do all my fly tying along with my uh, heavy metal rocker son who has a 15 piece uh, double bass drum set there. So we always fighting for space to do things with. So I'm, I'm the chairman of the fly tying group. Uh, I, I also write articles for uh, fly tire magazine. I've been involved with fly fishing, fly tying, especially. I, I fly tied first before I did any uh, fly fishing uh, for over 30 years now. So I wanna get started right away uh, so that everybody could uh, get ready to see this, hopefully. And Hey Jerry, while you're working on that, I just want you to know that there are a lot of people that are already interested in having you go play the drums. <laughs> <laughs> all righty let's all right can you it's the first time i want to i'm going to share the screen here i hit the share can you there we go i there knew you go, buddy. little all right so i was talking with uh with pete uh, for, uh about how how we should do these programs and i was telling him a story about um how i went out just a couple, just last week, and started fishing for panfish. So I did, uh, in a stream where it was up, was less than 500 uh, yards away from me, and had a great time. Didn't have to worry about social distancing because nobody ever fishes it. So here we go. What what is the fly tying group? Uh, it's always been there to uh, promote and encourage the art of fly tying. Uh, inspiring people to, to take an interest in the craft and helping them become knowledgeable and accomplished tires. So we're dedicated for the preservation, enhancement, and support of the art of fly tying. So with this, I want to put out a public service announcement. Even though with everything closed down, Fly Fishers International Fly Tying Challenge is still going on. The deadline is June 12th. Uh, information is located at the FFI website on the uh, fly, tying, uh, in fly Tying Challenge uh, tab in the Fly Tying group. And the overall category must tie all four flies for the required pattern list and a tiebreaker uh, of your choice. Individual categories, person entering the individual categories, uh, he could just, if a person just wants to tie one fly, they can. So great prize from our sponsor of Fly Tire Magazine. You'll get an over for the first place winner medal certificate and you, the winner and one guest will go to uh, will cast a trophy trout on the uh, Soku River in Georgia's beautiful Chattahoochee Natural National Forest. This is a package with the High Adventure Company including three nights lodging, two days guiding plus all meals and like I said this is from our sponsor 
Fly Tire Magazine. First place in categories will receive medals and certificates, plus all first place winners will get their photos and flies published in Fly Tire Magazine. Just to let you know, these are the only patterns you're allowed to tie. These are required patterns. The instruction list and everything is on the website. So go ahead while you're locked up, give it a shot, have some fun. So here we are in the, in the program. I always wondered, you know, being in this for over 30 years, I learned how to tie flies a specific way. You know, we started off with the, the gold rib hair, uh, the uh, woolly bugger, then we went to a, to a streamer, bucktail streamer, then we went to wet flies, and we always learned these flies like this. But as you, as you see, when you start going into fly shops now and uh, catalogs, you don't see these traditional patterns, the feathered winged patterns anymore. Um, very little. There's been, you might see the, the Royal Coachman, Ledwing Coachman, a couple of dark Cahills, but you don't see them the way they used to be during the Ray Bergman times. Now, I've noticed that there's been a resurgence in soft tackle wet flies. Uh, I'm starting to see more use uh, with them, people fishing them. Um, they're not just for trout, and they're extremely simple to tie. Just take a look at like the peacock and grizzly. It's just tinsel, peacock curl, and, and a hen uh, grizzly neck. That's all it is, folded back and a simple pattern and catches fish. Here's where everybody wants to tie beautiful partridge uh, style patterns like the partridge in orange. But I'm gonna tell you, working with a partridge body feather is frustrating. The thickness of the thorax, that ball. Remember, Pat, we were talking about that when we were discussing that? Yeah. That, uh, ball, if it's really thick, those feathers are going to splay out more. If it's thin, they're going to sweep back more towards the barb of the hook. So that, that is uh, one of the things to learn when you're tying the thorax. And as I said, uh, what do you do with all these large feathers that you get from a neck now? I mean, from a partridge. Uh, either tie them to use for legs on nymphs, but we, you know, how, how, what other ways can we do it to tie? So I'm gonna, uh, the, the gold rib hairs here, soft tackle is the pattern I'm going to demonstrate. It's also known as a, a, as a flimp. Um, it's a combination of a fly, a wet fly and a nymph. Uh, they're very, very successful. So uh, using the gold whips hairs here as an example, I'm gonna show two ways to use the partridge body feather. Okay, I'm gonna switch. So Jerry, while we're switching over, I'm gonna to jump to the, a question that Mike had asked sure. before you start tying. Uh, what, which soft tackle is your favorite? My, my favorite soft tackle is, um, is this uh, the, the one I'm demonstrating now? The uh, there gold you go. Uh, that's By the why way, I, I did not ask Jerry that question beforehand. So it, it is one of my favorites. Uh, it's very successful. It, it imitates that nymph and wet fly transition where the nymph is breaking from the the shuck to get out into the in, into the surface film. Um, so that is what that is my favorite, and I feel every time I teach that pattern and take someone out fishing with me, they uh, always catch fish with it. So to me, that's number one in the wet, in the soft tackle. Okay. So the first part I'm going to do is uh, traditional hackling. So I broke this up. The body's already tied with the tail of the body. Uh, but what I want to do is talk about, you know, traditionally, we always measured the uh, partridge feather so that it wouldn't extend past the bend of the hook. Then we stroke the feather back and then we uh, expose the tip of the tail. So the tip of the feather and tie that right in. Then I would cut that right off. Other people would do other things, but this is just a simple way of tying a traditional partridge feather. Then I would get my hackle pliers. And then as I'm getting ready to uh, wrap it, 
I would stroke the fibers back. It's like folding it, folding the hackle uh, backwards and then catching it so that all the fibers will start laying towards the bend of the hook. So I'll try to get two to two, two and a half, three turns of, uh, of this hackle, of this partridge feather. And as you see, that stem gets very thick. So that's why we tie it in by the tip. Because if we tied it in by the tail, that would be a very bulky head. A couple of wraps right, right behind it. Take your scissor and then trim that stem right off. Now that doesn't look good. Uh, I would fail myself right there if I was judging that. <laughs> trick of trick, just take your fingers and stroke them backwards. Put a decent head on. And you always got that one hair, that one feather that just doesn't want to cooperate. So we'll force it. Well, actually, you have a comment from uh, someone that said you should spit on your fingers required to get the fibers back. Depending on what time of night it is, you might want to try your bourbon or something like that. But Scotch goes. Yeah, and you had, a, you had one question uh, about whether you wet your fingers first before you were uh, pulling that back and wrapping. I, I actually did. <laughs> there you go. People know their game. <laughs> then then the, the quick whip finish. I always like the whip finish when they used to put the blade on there. You could either use now head cement or um, what uh, Sol Solaris has is uh, bone dry, which I think now is really taking the place of head cement because it dries immediately as soon as you put the uh, UV lamp right on it. So as soon as you hit it, it's dried immediately. Soaks in, done, penetrates. So, Jerry, before you move on, can I ask a question? Sure. So <clears throat> you're, you've talked about how to actually wrap that hackle, and you've got a specific size hook, which means you're looking for a specific size feather. And I think, as we all know, certain skins only have so much, so many feathers for a specific size, whether it's dry fly, soft tackles, or whatever, right? That how do you size the soft tackle feathers before you wrap them on? What I, what, I, what I do is, uh, I take, when I took the feather in the beginning, I would uh, look at the, the fibers to see if, how far they went. But basically what I do is I take the feather and I'll actually bend it along the shank of the hook under the shank to see how far that, that feather is going to stick out from gotcha. the uh, point of the hook. So that's one of the ways to do it. So it's, uh, you can't, it would be great if someone came up with a hackle gauge for partridge feathers like that, but it, it takes a lot, it takes practice. Um, when I, as, as an instructor and as I'm teaching beginners, uh, everybody goes for the big feather on the, on, the, uh, on the skin. And then when they tie it, it's like four times the length of, of what it should be. So we try to, they start learning by where on the feather that they could pull it from. And once you start that, you, you start to know your, the skin that you have. You, you basically say, well, all my 10s are in this range, all my 14s are in this range, so you can get away with it. A hey, quick question for you, Jerry. What size hook is that? That's a size uh, 10. All right. Go ahead, buddy. Oh, and for, for the people, I, I really do bend the barbs down. But when I'm doing fly tying demos, the barb is a indicator for me to know exactly where the bend of the hook is. So if I'm doing an instruction and I want people to know where the bend of the hook starts, it's always right where the point, right where the barb is, directly straight up is where the bend is. So except for San Juan worm, except for San Juan worm hooks, but we'll let that go. I don't even tie those. <laughs> 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 so just uh as you can see, it's wrapped pretty well around and it'll look uh, pretty good. Now, here's another option. You don't hear too many of us uh, talking about it, but you know, you spent 30 bucks, $25 on a neck of uh, hide. So you got all these longer feathers. So just to show you what I would do is just measure them to about the length of the shank of the hook. I would uh, pull out a left and a right side as I'm getting ready to do now, I, I, take, I take the tip out because I do not need that uh, stem uh, sticking out. I only want the left side and the right side. So I'm going to cut that. 
you try cutting a feather when you got a video camera in between you. <laughs> so that's why my hands are always shaking. There's always, I'm always overstretched out. So now I'll take uh, the left, the left side of the feather and the right, but here's the left, measure it to the shank of the hook, and I'll line it right where I'm going to tie it in. So now that all these fibers are, are an exact distance length that I want, and I'll just put two loose wraps right there. And, and you can see it's ready to 180 degrees. That's already like half of the circle right there. And then I'll trim that off. Make sure you don't pull it or all those fibers will come out with it. And then I'll take the other side to the far side. So I did the near side. Now I'm going to line it up with the far side. Same thing. Two loose wraps. By doing these two loose wraps, they basically almost spin themselves on, on the shank of the hook. There are so other Jerry, looking at this, it, it's almost the same kind of loose wrap, tight wrap, like you would when you're spinning deer hair. That's exactly it. And Pat, that's what we were talking about a couple, yep. of weeks, a couple of weeks ago, of how we could almost spin the feather on, on the shank of the hook. And now I'm doing these tight, and now watch all the fibers just spin around. Perfect. Now you save, now you can tie even more flies with the longer feathers. See how they go all the way around. So you, by the way, just want you to know, you had a question specifically about uh, uh, how to use some of the bigger feathers that may not be sized appropriately. And uh, uh, just had a, uh, you just answered the question. So well done, Jerry. So now once again, you know, we're doing the same thing over again, whip finish. Put a little drop, uh, cut it, and put a drop of either head cement or UV resin on there, and that will uh, make the fly nice and shiny, or uh, and secure those thread wraps on there. So, Jerry, while you're doing that, you actually have a question about uh, what kind of head cement with the UV light you're using. That is, uh, it's it's Solaries. It's a uh, extremely thin viscosity, very thin. Uh, it, it's it's about the same uh, viscosity as uh, your uh, head cement that you would use either Sally Hansen's hardened nails. Remember? Yeah, that's to what I always that. used to use. Yep. Yeah, and and get that fumes going with it, or uh, th so that that's usually any any of the even the liquid uh, head cement, the water based one will work. But uh, how many times do you always have to keep? putting it on a magnet and letting it dry a few more minutes before throwing it in a box, yeah. in your fly box. Once this is done in that 10th of a second with that UV light, it's locked into place and ready to fish. So before you get to the inaction, Jerry, you mind if I throw a couple questions at you? Sure. Go ahead. So there was a question of whether you use partridge as a tail also. It looked like wood duck to me from here. And it is wood duck. Yeah. And, um, oh, and just, just to let everybody know, the complete uh, beginning to end of this fly uh, pattern is in the, uh, the video uh, library on, on the FFI website. So all these, these patterns that I teach are also on there. So you can get to t download them and have a great time with them. So Jerry, I'm glad you brought that up because actually there was a question that was my very next question is where you find the recipe, recipe for the fly. And for those that don't know, if you go to Fly Fishers International and go to the Learning Center, uh, there are, there, first of all, there's a ton of incredible information about casting, tying, conservation, and fly fishing skills, but there are over 600 fly tying videos. It's the premier repository of fly tying videos you'll find anywhere in terms of quality control, ability to search for them. Um, it's definitely worth checking out. So uh, thank you for the question, Molly, and thanks for answering that, Jerry. Um, let me see if I can add any more. Uh, I'll tell you what, why don't you move on, Jerry, and I'm going to sort through some of these questions we have and see where we come back, okay? Sure, sure. Now, one of the things, uh, as I said, you now here we are in lockdown, and all this was was this pattern is just cast into the, that, that foam, dead drift through, and then let it swing. I did put a, uh, some uh, lead, uh, soft lead, but it's not lead, it's now tungsten. Let it swing in the current. And 
bam, they, they, these fish are aggressive, they're fast, and it just, once you find where they are, you can sit here and catch 50 of them. But look how beautiful they are. And, and you should always scale your equipment to, to the fish that you're, you're fishing with. I'm using here an Orvis uh, Superfine one weight with a double taper uh, one weight line. And, and it, these fish aren't leader shy. That's a 4X tippet on the end with a size yeah. 10 uh, soft tackle uh, fly there. So all I did was just basically walk over to this creek. It's in a, it's in a township park. Um, and this is the headwaters of the Neshaminy right in my own town. So, yep. so you got to, you, you've, you've actually really done a great job, Jerry, of hitting on some questions that came up, which was about the technique for fishing soft tackles. And obviously you've touched on swinging them in the current. And there was another question about whether, uh, you may add weight to, uh, to the flies. And I, I guess, you know, uh, from your comments and my experience, you fish them as needed. I mean, some of the soft tackles might be better as, Caddis emerges where you can fish them on weight and fish them down, down deep. Um, and, and, and obviously, you know, you and I were talking about this, Jerry. I mean, the, one of the reasons that soft tackles have really found a resurgence is because of the ability to tie them as beadhead flies. Correct. Correct. You want to talk, touch on that a little bit? Now, um, one of the ways to get the fly down deep is throw, throw a beadhead in there, right? Um, and what you're doing is you're tying, you're tying it right you're, you're wrapping the hackle right behind the bead. So there's nothing different on how I tied it. It's just what happens is, is you just got to uh, learn to play with the body and, and that little space in between the bead. And then you're going to wrap in, you could even put what is called as the new, as, as the, as other people are doing hot spots behind them. You can get a fluorescent uh, thread behind there and, and put a hot spot there, it seems like that's even uh, a uh, great, how could I say, uh, attractor, especially if it's a, like a UV color. For some reason, I don't yep. know how they see it, but that, that hot spot behind the bead becomes something that they just key on. Yeah. So, Jerry, we got a few more questions. Um, so one, I'm going to take the first one. So um, the question is whether you have experience fishing the soft tackles in the pond with no current, which I'm sure you do. But uh, uh, I just want to tell a, a quick story. I had the, the uh, great fortune to actually uh, head down around the Tallahassee, Florida area in January before everybody had to stay home and uh, was fishing with the chairman of the Fly Fishers International Board, Tom Logan, who specializes in fishing for uh, panfish, including bluegills the size of dinner plates um, in his local lakes. And he, when I was with him, we only used traditional Irish wet flies, uh, you know, casting them into likely locations, maybe letting them sink a little bit, and either lifting the rod tip, almost like a lysen ring lift you might use, uh, you know, in a river with a nymph, or just a slow, slow strip and boy, I'll tell you, some of those wet fly patterns for panfish in still water can seem absolutely irresistible. And, and it's, it, you're, you touched on another point. Um, you mentioned caddis flies and how they uh, imitate that uh, a difference between how it splits from the larvae to the adult. While I was fishing that uh, creek, uh, I, when I was editing the videos, there were rises uh, at least another couple of yards away that they were taking caddis flies on yep. the surface. So it was kind of funny that later, earlier in the day, as I was trying to just nymph fish for them, they weren't touching it, nymph fishing with a bead head. They wanted that rise, that lissering lift uh, to come in. And that's what they were keying on that, that race that they were racing to the surface. So when you saw me casting it downstream, it was that dead drift, and then the current was lifting up my, my fly line up to, 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 stim, to stimulate them as if it was a, a merger happening. And yeah, and e even for some of the, uh, some of the mayflies that are uh, pretty solid swimmers, um, using classic wet flies on that kind of swing and lift is, is really deadly. I mean, I know, you know, in the Northeast, uh, 
There's a nice Aniki hatch, pretty good size, dark colored mayfly. And that lead wing coachman is probably the best fly you could fish on a swing when those, when those bugs are hatching. You know, even over some of the more modern, perfectly tied with just the right amount of legs and the segments in the abdomen. I mean, you get a leg wing coachman on a swing like that and it's just deadly. Per perfect example of, uh, of using a wet fly is use it as a dropper. You could tie that off as um, uh, like a, a dropper by tying the mo uh, tying your uh, lead monofilament to the bend of uh, the wet fly and adding another couple of inches, like four or five or six inches off of the bend and put a nymph there. So you can have two flies and that wet fly, uh, you're fishing at, at different depths. Another way I like to do it is using the tag end of a, of a blood knot and, and tying the wet fly on that tag end yep. and having the nymph come off, come off the blood knot, fly, uh, fishing two flies. I don't know how many times I would uh, nymph fish with a uh, royal coachman and catch more brown trout on the royal, on the, uh, royal coachman wet than on the nymph because they, they just happen to key on, on a different, you're, you're fishing different uh, sections, levels of the, of the stream. So let me get to uh, some more questions here. Uh, we've got some good ones. So going back to the different kinds of tying techniques, whether you wrap it or whether you spin the soft tackle, do you find any difference in durability between either technique? Uh, no, they're, they're both, if you tie uh, your patterns with tension on your thread, the durability will be the same. Uh, I have not found any, and plus remember, that head cement really locks that that um, material in tight. So do, do, and do you ever find though that the head cement soaks into either the hackle or the ball of dubbing and changes its uh, sort of activity in the water? I haven't found that to happen. Um, I know some people have complained about it, but uh, I, I when I was tying earlier, I, I got a little ticked off at myself by letting too much out onto that on there. I didn't control it enough. Uh, I normally do not like the cement to get into the feather at all like that. It, it, but I don't, I don't ever see that much difference in the, uh, in, in the play of the materials if, if it does. If you over cemented it, like if it went into the thorax area, I think then you'd have a problem. The object is, is to keep it on the head. Sure. Sure. And you and I were talking about this too, when we were talking about tying soft tackles, um, that dubbing ball can really dictate, you know, how that uh, tackle sits up, you know, or down. Big fat dubbing ball can make it really stand out and sit it flat. Uh, sit flat. You talked about that too. Um, you have any preference for um, either three things, the whatever you might use for dubbing itself. I know I like um, natural hair for, um, wet flies you may have a different choice no. um, any preference for type of hook there's a lot of different styles or the thread that you might use especially for smaller flies smaller flies I'm using uni thread um, 80 uh, I still to this day will use uh, 60 Danville for the larger flies sure so uh, I don't I don't go into the uh, the gel spun a lot of people are starting I'm starting to hear more and more people getting into that the only time I ever use the gel spun is when I'm doing hair stacking, um, you know, multiple layers of deer hair, because that's, it's, all, it's as strong as, ke as the old Kevlar thread was, where you almost yep. cut the deer hair in half. But um, I, I have, still have Danville. It's still very good for me. Uh, I probably, when I was uh, doing a lot more teaching, I used to, uh, have a stockpile of it. I still have about 20 rolls of just black Danville sitting on my uh, desk right now to use when I'm doing demonstrations and teaching others. Um, the uni thread, I, I do like it, but I like it for the smaller patterns. Uh, yep. And you're talking about dubbing fur. Um, not to say that I'm a traditionalist, but dubbing fur, natural hairs here, when I, and I actually shave it off of the mask of a rabbit uh, and throw it in a coffee blender. There you go. It, it just 
feels better in my hands when I'm wrapping or making a dubbing noodle. For 30 years, I have never used wax. It's All right, so we got, uh, uh, oh, actually, no, we, we got to make sure we answer the question about uh, hook style, not necessarily size, but. Okay, the hook style. I, without going into name brands, because uh, there's a million brands out there now, uh, traditional wet fly patterns, I would stay with the traditional wet fly hook. Uh, for, for example, I, I've been tying a lot more with a, a Dairichi uh, hook. Um, I like the way they package it. Not only do they give you the model number, but they also give you a little paragraph on there uh, to tell you what that it would be used for. So I would, I've used more of Dairichi now, and I don't want to bash Mustad. Uh, for 20 something years, I've always been a Mustad tire, but uh, when they shipped their production to a different country, the style changed. Their specific hooks that they said were one X long were now two X long. And it threw me for a loop when I was tying on a, uh, for the fly tying uh, skill award. I had newer modeled hooks and the old modeled hooks. And when I sent them in, Tom Logan knocked points off because they were different sizes. <laughs> All right, so last, last question. We wanna make sure we don't keep people too long. And this is actually a really good one, Jerry. So. Uh, I'm just going to read it. It's from the Eastern Waters Council Fly Fishers International. It looks like Jerry is showing video on fly tying that has been recorded early. It is an excellent uh, video image. Can Jerry describe his camera setup to get this great <laughs> image? That's a good one. It, it's, if you saw how much lighting happens at my tying bench, uh, it, it I think I got like 15,000 looms coming through on a workbench uh, lamp that you get at Home Depot. That's behind my camera, above and behind. The camera is a video, it's a high definition camera. It's not expensive, it's only $200 from Best Buy. Uh, it's got an HDMI output to it, but I don't need that because I'm, I'm recording digitally. But the key to the, the key is on the lens, is a ring light. So it's even lighting on the, on the subject matter. Once I, I uh, take that uh, video, those segments, I'm using uh, a uh, video software and I do all my editing there. So it's all in HD. So my videos come out that way. Um, I will always have a video camera is actually set up between my body and the vice. And this is one of the critiques I give people when they are videotaping and posting flies. If you're putting your camera on the participant side, it makes it a little more difficult for a beginner to follow your directions because now he's got to flip it in his mind in reverse. You're giving him a mirror image. If you put the camera between your body and, and your subject matter, they're getting it as if you are the tire and they get the instruction that way. Yep. Um, well, uh, we got participants that say they're raising their hand. I just want everybody to know uh, all the contact here is done through the Q and A in the chat. Um, so while we'll see if they can type that in, but while we are uh, wrapping up here, Jerry, um, just want to uh, give you the chance to mention any, uh, well, we know that there will be future uh, episodes here with you and uh, any idea when the next one's going to be and what the subject matter is going to be? Subject matter is going to be taming elk hair, a stimulating a subject. Well, I, you know, I tell you what, that's a tough one for a lot of people too, especially figuring out uh, the quality of the hair, what kind of hair. Uh, how much thread pressure you can use before you flare it and it looks like a, you know, <laughs> that, a wig. And, uh, and using a stimulator is perfect for that because yeah. your tail is elk hair. Yeah. How much pressure do you put on that before it looks like something from a, like you're ready to tie a mouse pattern? Yeah, yeah. And the wing, you want to be able to make sure that splays correctly. 
and looks looks like almost like a stonefly because it is a stonefly imitation. So that's yeah. what I'm I'm working on right now. Plus, I have footage from when I was was out in Wyoming on casting uh, to Yellowstone cuts, just using a, a size tw ten stimulator, and they were just going wild for that. All right. So, any idea what what uh, what the date's going to be on that, Jerry? Give me a give me at least a week and a half, and I'm ready to go. Awesome. And so, for everybody out there that watched tonight, thanks so much for uh, for joining us. Um, I am Patrick Berry. I'm the president and CEO of Fly Fishers International, and Jerry has uh, entertained us tonight with uh, his chat on soft tackles. And uh, we'll have the schedule um, up on a rolling basis. Um, again, if you didn't catch it earlier, tomorrow night. Jeff Courier is going to be on talking about, he's from Jeff Courier of Global Fly Fishing, uh, talking about the salmon and secret giant brown trout of, uh, of uh, Iceland. And if you haven't seen the picture that we put in the uh, teaser for that, um, it's about that big around. And then um, Thursday night, Dave Peterson is going to have conservation conversations with uh, the folks from uh, um, our partner organization, the Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. So Hey, Jerry, thank you, buddy. I appreciate it. Um, I think you, everybody enjoyed it. You had a lot of people on tonight, and uh, we're looking forward to growing this. Um, so if you're watching, pass it along to anybody and everybody. Thanks, Jerry. Oh, you're welcome. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody.